one of the most interesting things about the word antichrist is how we understand it. What is the antichrist to you? Is it a system? Is it a person? Is it a place? You know, I, I really don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Have you studied the Bible about what uh, the Antichrist is? Uh, Book of Revelations, yeah. So what is the Antichrist to you? Is it a system? Is it a person? Is it a place? Mm, I guess it's like, to me, it's an energy source or a type of uh, negative energy. So do you think the Antichrist uh, is a person, many persons, or a system? Well, from what is said in the New Testament, the Antichrist was many people. Do you have any idea of what the Antichrist is? Is it a person, is it a place, or a system? No, but usually if it has to do with anything regarding religion, I stay away from it. The Antichrist, is it a system, is it a person? You were explaining a little bit about it, but what is it in just one or two words? Um, the Antichrist is actually a, is a person. I met him actually the other day. It was, his, it was a white guy. He was pretending to uh, say his name was Jesus. He had a cigarette in his mouth, and he told me he was going to walk across the water. I think it's a person. Yeah. To you, is the Antichrist something that is here or that is something from the past or that will be in the future? To me, it's a presence. To me, it's a presence that's always here. The word Antichrist appears just a few times in Scripture, four in fact, and always in the writings of John, in his epistles. Now, the Bible teaches that the word Antichrist not only means against Christ, but actually in the place of Christ. You don't find the word itself, but just in a few places. But the career and the person of this Antichrist figure, you find it uh, in numerous places. Daniel in the Old Testament primarily, but then in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you find it in Revelation 13, and Jesus here, obviously speaking to the issue of this Antichrist figure. The picture we get in the Bible is not necessarily someone who is dark and evil in appearance, but actually someone who appears to be like Christ. When we actually go to the book of Daniel, the, the book that Jesus specifically said that we should reference in an end time context, we find that there was one chapter there in particular, well two, but one that really stands out, and that's Daniel chapter 7. Now, in Daniel chapter 7, we actually just have the outworking of something that Daniel has already disclosed in Daniel chapter 2. Now, in chapter 2, we have a very important dream that the king Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon had. And in the dream, there's this metal man, this metal image, and the man has different parts of his body. The idol has different parts of his body that are made of different metals. He's a giant metal man. And according to Daniel's own interpretation of the prophecy, we don't have to guess, we don't have to wonder, he gives it to us. This metal man is a kind of timeline, a kind of chronological sequence progressing from the head of gold to the chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, long legs of iron, and then the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. It starts obviously as it is told in chapter 2, and the prophet Daniel is the person to tell Nebuchadnezzar that the golden head is Babylon. And here you have this timeline, this sweep of history, if you will, going from Babylon to Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia to Greece, Greece to Rome, and finally the division of Rome. Now when we come to Daniel chapter 7, we find that same sequence recapitulated, revisited. Now when we come to Daniel 7, we see that this time Daniel himself receives a vision. And it's totally different from the one in Daniel 2, but at the same time, it is similar. The message of these two dreams is the same, but they are given in a different context. To the pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, the dream comes in the form of a gigantic statue, an idol, if you please, not because God approves of idols, but because he can use that to communicate with a man who knows nothing better. When we get to Daniel chapter 7, however, the man, the metal man is now replaced. He's replaced with beasts, four beasts. In Daniel 7, it begins with these four beasts, and it tells us very clearly in Daniel 7, uh, verse 17, that the beasts represent kings or kingdoms. Just as Daniel was told, now we discover these four beasts are four consecutive kingdoms and empires, just like the four metals of Daniel 2. And the first beast that comes up is a lion, and uh, he has wings like an eagle, so obviously symbolic. The lion is like the golden head of the image in chapter 2. 
which would mean the lion with the eagle's wings stands for Babylon. The lion with the eagle's wings was almost like the bald eagle in the United States of America. I mean, it was their national symbol. And you even have texts like in Jeremiah 49, where it speaks about Babylon being a lion and being an eagle. When you walked down the processional way in ancient Babylon, it was lined on either side with these giant lions with eagle's wings. So we have evidence from scripture and evidence from archaeology telling us that the lion with eagle's wings is a very appropriate picture of Babylon. The first beast, the lion with eagle's wings, is followed by a bear. And two significant details here. The bear has three ribs in the mouth. Not four, not two, not five, but three ribs in the mouth. And the bear is hunched up on one side, Scripture says. And that shows that the alliance between the Medes and the Persians was not an alliance of equals, that the, the Persians were actually stronger than the Medes. That's why the bear's humped up on one side. And then it says it has three ribs in its mouth. The three ribs are the three provinces of Babylon that needed to be conquered in order for Medo-Persia to come to prominence. It had to overthrow Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. I think the precision of the biblical language is remarkable. But even Medo-Persia would not stay forever. And what follows Medo-Persia is a four-headed leopard. And scripture says it has four wings, four wings of a bird. Who comes after the Persians? Of course, the Greeks came. And it's interesting that the Greeks are depicted by a leopard with four heads. After Alexander's death, there was no single man, no single general that was charismatic enough, influential enough, powerful enough to step right into those gigantic shoes. I mean, we don't call him Alexander the Great for nothing, right? Alexander died when he was really young, in his 30s, and he was planning to make Babylon the capital. He had already started the city of Alexandria, very modestly named after himself, right? And he wanted Babylon to be the capital. He was going to rebuild it. However, when he died, his dreams died with him. And so what ended up happening to Alexander's empire, his great empire, is that it was actually significantly divided into four parts. The four heads are the four kingdoms that came because Greece was divided after the death of Alexander the Great. Now think about that. Scripture says that it was a leopard with four heads. And you have these four generals, uh, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, and they're all they're all going to different parts of Alexander's empire because he died at such a young age. Victor Hugo, the historian, famously said that Alexander could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer himself. This third beast was followed by a fourth beast, and that fourth beast is a symbol of the Roman Empire. Interestingly enough, Daniel cannot think of any description any animal in the natural world to describe this beast. Something about this fourth beast defied description. It was just ferocious and mean and, and powerful. He says, it was dreadful and terrible and it was exceedingly strong. And uh, for a very significant tie into Daniel chapter 2, which is the sort of archetypal prophecy here, it has iron teeth iron teeth, which reminds us of the iron legs of Daniel chapter 2. And those iron teeth obviously correspond to the legs of iron in the vision of Daniel 2. And of course, this ferocious, nondescript beast that apparently reigns for a long time corresponds with the iron monarchy of Rome. Rome came on the scene, and Rome was much more powerful than the others ruled a larger territory, including large parts of Europe, all the way up to the borders of Scotland. Julius Caesar conquered England. He conquered Gaul, which was France. It was a huge empire and very powerful for a very long time. And so what we're finding in Daniel chapter 7 is really just a revisiting or a recapitulation of what we saw in Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. That's what we see in Daniel 2. When we go to Daniel 7, we see the same progression. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. He says 
he was looking at the horns that came out of the beast. Now, the same chapter tells us that the ten horns were kings, were powers. Now, there is something significant here, I think, and that is that you have the feet partly of iron and partly of clay in Daniel chapter 2, and you have ten toes. And this beast, very significantly, who we have identified as Rome, a ferocious, terrible, strange, uh, very uh, brutal beast, has ten horns. So you see correspondence here, not just with the iron to iron, but with the ten toes to the ten horns. And the final phase, which is not a kingdom, but it's uh, following Rome, it's a breakup into iron and clay, which don't really mix together. So it's, it's sort of a division of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire was never overthrown. It was simply conquered from within. It was divided. And this fourth beast has ten horns. And we know that Rome was taken over by tribes, by Germanic tribes, that have now occupied Europe, all of Europe. Rome was divided. Well, I wonder what the prophecy says about that. Verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, look at these five words, the kingdom shall be divided. The kingdom shall be what? Divided. The kingdom will be divided. In other words, there will not be a conquering of this fourth iron kingdom, but the division of it. The kingdom will be divided. So you see, all of this is very, very fascinating, very intricate history and power play. When you read it, it's just absolutely dramatic and fascinating. But the more you get into it, the more you see how the book of Daniel was very, very accurate, not only in Daniel 2, but in the expansion in Daniel 7. This interpretation of Daniel chapter 7, the, the lion, the bear, the leopard, the indescribable, uh, scary beast, the fourth beast. This is, this interpretation of that being Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, this is not some fanciful new interpretation. This has actually been a part of Christian interpretation of Bible prophecy for a very long time. For example, when you go to Nuremberg, one of the cities in Germany, uh, you have the Rathaus there, it's, it's the mayor's residence, and uh, there they put up statues of the four pictures in stone of these four beasts. These very beasts that we're describing here, you have the lion with the eagle's wings and you have the bear that's got the three ribs in the mouth. You also see the four-headed leopard with the four wings and then this ferocious strange beast with ten horns. And in every one of those sculptures of the four beasts, just beside the sculpture is a, is a soldier or a prominent person from that time era. So for example, what you find with the lion with eagle's wings is here's a Babylonian looking gentleman. Some have suggested maybe it was Nebuchadnezzar himself. Then when you go of course to uh, the bear with the three ribs, you see a Medo-Persian figurine right there. Then you go to the leopard with the four heads and the four wings, you see a, a figure that looks very much like what we might imagine Alexander the Great looking like, and, and obviously a Greek soldier. And then the ferocious beast, you see the ten horns, and then a Roman soldier. So here you have, if you please, an interpretation of Daniel 7 in stone. So you can see that this is not an obscure interpretation. So this is not something new or something novel. This interpretation is the time-honored, and frankly, it is the historically verified uh, application of this prophecy. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome the division of Rome. But where in Daniel chapter 2, the next thing that we see is the division of Rome into its various parts, some strong, some weak. Uh, we also see that in Daniel chapter 7, but there's some additional information that is here added. And that gets us right to the heart of what we're talking about, and that's the Antichrist. People who have taken the Bible seriously have always understood Daniel chapter 7 this way. Take Hippolytus. He lived in the late 2nd century, early 3rd century. Listen to what he had to say. The golden head of the image and the lioness denoted the Babylonians. The shoulders and the arms of silver and the bear represented the Persians and Medes. 
The belly and thighs of brass and the leopard meant the Greeks who held sovereignty from Alexander's time. The legs of iron and the beast, dreadful and terrible, expressed the Romans, who hold sovereignty at present. The toes of the feet, which were part clay and part iron, and the ten horns were emblems of the kingdoms that are yet to arise. The other little horn that grows up among them meant the Antichrist in their midst. The stone that smites the earth and brings judgment upon the world was Christ. Hippolytus is saying here very clearly in his day that he is living in the time of that fourth beast, that the ten kingdoms have not yet arisen, and that the Antichrist has not yet come. And it is truly fascinating that even before our time, hundreds of years ago, this vision was being understood, it was being understood as a description of history of history foretold. Serious Bible students have always understood where they're at in the flow of human history. Whether it was Jesus making it clear where he was in Daniel's prophecies, or Bible students like Hippolytus understanding where he was in the flow of history, or even us today knowing that we are living in the time after the division of Rome, after the Antichrist has arisen. Even though we don't have a name, even though we don't have a specific identification as we do with, for example, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, we can know who the Antichrist is as it matures and develops through history. He tells us, for example, in verse 8, And I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. It's a little horn. None of the other horns are called little horns. This horn is specifically identified as a little horn. A horn represents a king or a kingdom. A little horn represents a little kingdom. Now, we understand this little horn to be identified as the Antichrist. It comes up among the other horns. What does that mean? It says that it comes up among them which only makes sense. If you're looking at the ten and another one comes up, Daniel says it comes up among them. So this horn is going to arise somewhere from the ashes of the division of the Roman Empire. It's directing us to Europe. We have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Pagan Rome conquered the world. Pagan Rome established itself, its base in Europe. This little horn comes up among the others. When the pagan Roman Empire fell, it was divided into ten parts, ten tribes. And among those ten tribes comes up this little horn. So we know the Antichrist is going to develop in Europe. Let's be clear. This little horn power comes up out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. When we're looking for the Antichrist, we're not looking in Tokyo. We're not looking in China. We're not looking in the Middle East. We are looking in the fragmented Roman Empire. That's where we should see this little horn, Antichrist power, arise. And as Daniel watches this little horn come up, he noticed that this little horn has eyes like the eyes of a man. Daniel says that, this horn, he doesn't say that about any of the other horns. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man. The eyes of a man, intelligence, wisdom, leadership, all based on man, not necessarily on the Word of God. And so for Daniel, apparently, in some significant way at least to Daniel, uh, in the vision, that this horn had, had a man at its head in some significant way, uh, in some way that was fundamentally different than the way that the other horns did. Of course, if they're kingdoms, they have a king, no problem there. But something separated this horn uh, from the others in the sense that there was a man in a very uh, prominent way and in a very different way at the head. He tells us, for example, in verse 8, that the little horn is going to pluck up three other horns as it rises. It says that when it comes to power, it plucks up three horns by the roots. So this is a power that comes to power violently, that it is taking out other kingdoms as it comes to power. Another key characteristic is the diversity of this power from the others. It was different. It comes up at this time, it uproots some of these, these kings, these different horns, and yet 
this horn has got very distinct traits, very distinct characteristics that make it different from these others. So you're dealing with a different kind of political entity here, though. Daniel describes this power as somehow different. As it's coming up, he says it was diverse or different from the other horns that were before it. So there's something different about this power. Now, when we're looking at these characteristics, specifically in Daniel 8 is where they begin about the little horn. We find the little horn coming up after the end of the fourth power towards its demise. Now we know that fourth power is pagan Rome and so the little horn power has to rise after the fall of the Roman Empire after 476 AD. It says about the little horn that it speaks blasphemy. It has eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Revelation chapter 13 adds to the great things the word blasphemies. The power is described in both Daniel 7 and in Revelation 13 as being blasphemous, blasphemous. Now, that's a word that we might have a lot of different ideas about. You might think that blasphemous is one thing, I might think it's something else, we could take a vote. But scripturally speaking, we find in the New Testament two uh, very specific things that are identified as blasphemous. Interestingly enough, in the Gospels, we find an explanation for what blasphemy is actually all about. Jesus meets a sick person who wants to be healed. And he does not only heal the person physically, but tells the person, your sins are forgiven. Jesus obviously wanted, always wanted to, to heal the whole person. And to heal someone spiritually was the real goal that Jesus had. And to heal someone spiritually meant for him to forgive his sins. Jesus forgave a man's sins, and the Jews were incredulous. They were beside themselves. They said, who is this man that speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And so here we have a very concise and very powerful uh, and helpful biblical definition of blasphemy. To claim to be able to forgive sins without the corresponding right to forgive sins, and that right, of course, is God's alone. Now, another instance in Scripture is Jesus claims to be God. He says, I and my Father are one. The Jews are beside themselves. And uh, Jesus says, what are you going to stone me for? For one of my good works? And the response of the Jewish hierarchy of, of Jesus' day was, we're not stoning you because of your good works. We're going to stone you, which of course they didn't do, but we're going to stone you for blasphemy because you, being a man, make yourself God. And so here's a second biblical definition. Again, very concise and very reasonable uh, definition of blasphemy, to claim to be God. Now coming back to Daniel and Revelation, what does it mean then to blaspheme God? It means to put yourself in the position of God and do things that are the absolute prerogatives of God, like forgiveness of sins. The religious leaders of Jesus' day, they perceived that claim as blasphemous, but Jesus, because He was God incarnate, could legitimately make the claim to be one with God and to be God. So here, obviously, in the little horn and in the beast in Revelation 13, we have a power that tries to act like God, forgiving sins. It is usurping the power of God. But if somebody else made that claim, for example, if I made that claim, or you made that claim, or any man made that claim, except for the man Christ Jesus, uh, that is a blasphemous claim. And so, to claim to be able to forgive sins, and to claim to be God on earth, blasphemous. Verse 21 of Daniel 7 identifies this little horn as making war with the saints and prevailing against them. Here's another characteristic that's very important. It's going to be a persecuting power, and it specifically is going to persecute the saints. It says clearly that this is a persecuting power. In Daniel 7, verse 21, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. Now, when you look at Bible prophecy, you understand that the saints are identified as those who keep the commandments of God and keep their faith in Jesus Christ. They have the faith of Jesus and they keep the commandments of God. This little horn power, this Antichrist, is going to persecute specifically those who keep the commandments of God. In Daniel 7, 
where it says that the little horn power will persecute the saints. In the same sentence it says it will also intend to change times and law. It will think to change times and laws. This Antichrist is a lawless power that attacks God's law. Now times and law in the Hebrew understanding is something that belongs to God because God is the God of time and He's the God of the law. He's the lawgiver. Antichrist is not simply doing away with the law of God, but putting another law in its place. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 is probably a very clear understanding of this when it says it will seek to change times and laws. In other words, it's not doing away with the law, but it's taking the law and making a change. This is also something that shows that it goes against God. This is also a kind of blasphemy. Arguably one of the most powerful indicators in the prophecy itself as to who this power is, is the duration of time, the tenure of time that this little horn power would be prominently on the scene. And Daniel says that he would reign for a time, times and half a time. Now looking at the Aramaic that is used here, it's very clear that a time and times in the plural, that's two times and half a time, together makes up three and a half times. The easiest way to reckon that, and Revelation 13 helps us with that, is to say this is three and a half years. Three and a half years. But in Revelation 13, we just read it, it says this power shall last for 42 months. And so Daniel seems to be saying that this power would reign for three and a half years. Now, in our time, we, we operate on a calendar that has, what, 365 and a quarter days in a year. In Daniel's time, there were 12 months and 30 days in a month, and so you would have a year as 360 days. Now, you do the math. A time is 360. Times would be two more, that's 720. And half a time, you add it all up together. You have 360 plus 720 plus 180, 1,260 days. Now significantly, and there's very good reason to believe that we have, we have correctly understood this because this time period comes up seven times in Scripture in, in direct reference to this power. Uh, we find it in the book of Daniel and tellingly we find it in the book of Revelation. Seven times, 1,260 days. Now just as the symbols in the prophecy suggest that these beasts are not really beasts but they're they're nations, and these horns are not really horns, but they're kings and kingdoms. So too, time itself takes on a symbolic dimension. And what we find in Scripture, there's very good textual evidence to suggest that one prophetic day corresponds with an actual, literal calendar year. So you can think of an equivalence in your mind. A day in end time Bible prophecy is equivalent to one literal year. Now, three and a half years would make up 1260 days, which would be years according to the prophetic principle of a day stands for a year, the year-day principle. Daniel says that the tenure, I mean think of this, the career of this power that would wage war against the saints of God, would speak blasphemous words against God, would change times and laws of God, would reign not just for a short time, not for a three and a half literal years, uh, that would be bad enough. This power reigns for more than a millennium. Prophetically, that comes out to 42 months or 1260 prophetic days or literal years. Daniel is saying this little horn, this blasphemous persecuting power, make war against God and His people. Another characteristic that we find, especially when we look at this in relation to Revelation 13, is this, this is a worldwide power. It says in Revelation 13 that all the world, verse 3, will wonder after this power and will worship this power. Now it gets very exciting here because John begins to give us more details. Uh, some of the same kinds of things but in, in different language that we saw in Daniel chapter 7. For example, we learn that this power is now global in its influence and so we're looking for uh, a power here of global significance, of global import. 
even though it's a little horn power, that means it's a smaller power, it's a little power, so it's, it's small in its kingdom, but it's huge worldwide in its influence. According to Revelation, the Antichrist is not a secular power. This isn't about barcodes and credit cards or computers named the beast. This is about worship. This is a religious power. You've got a sequence of kingdoms. Babylon is, you know, one beast. Medo-Persia is another beast. Greece is another beast. Pagan Rome is another beast. Then you've got this little horn power. You know, these are all kingdoms. These are all kingdoms. These are all political, military powers and, or whatever. And then you've got another power coming up, this little horn power, which has very distinct religious aspects to it. You know, there's a religious element to it there. In fact, in Revelation 13 and 14, worship, 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 worship. It occurs eight times. And so worship is, is obviously a factor here. You're given very specific details about it, a time frame about it. It's a blasphemous power. So there's a religious element to this little horn power that's not really seen in the political entities that came before it. So maybe for a historian, uh, this is clear. And uh, for people who are familiar with history, this is very clear. We've looked at a number of different identifiers, a, a number of different characteristics, and uh, someone who is familiar with history is going to be able to put those things together just very easily. But what about the rest of us? What about the rest of us who may not uh, be absolutely conversant in history? Uh, how can we be sure who this power is? Well, let's just take uh, five of the indicators, okay? Just five of them. Uh, it's a worldwide power, right? According to uh, Revelation, uh, it's a worldwide power. So that's number one. Number two, it's a religious power. In both Daniel and Revelation, uh, in Revelation explicitly, in Daniel implicitly, we see this power presented as a religious power. And so take that one, number two. Uh, number three, this power rises up out of the ashes of divided Rome, or what we today would call Europe. And so it's going to rise up in Europe. So keep it in your mind now, right? It's a worldwide power that's religious that comes up in Europe. It has a prominent man at its head. Remember Daniel said that in some significant way, uh, in a way that was somewhat different than the other kingdoms, that this power would have a very prominent man at its head, okay? And then finally, uh, that it would claim to be able to forgive sins. Remember, it's a blasphemous power. So just put it all together. Just, just see if you can come up with it yourself. It's not difficult. Uh, this is sort of uh, the version for the rest of us. A worldwide power, that's religious, that rises up in Europe, that has a prominent man at its head and claims to be able to forgive sins. Well, you look at those basic principles, and there's only one power it can point to, the papacy, papal Rome. The point of this message is not individuals, it's institutions. I was raised a Catholic. This is not about Catholics. This is about Bible prophecy. So let's go back over the identifiers that we discovered in Daniel and Revelation. Let's see if they fit. Let's see if we have accurately identified uh, just who this power is. Well, first of all, the, the very first thing that Daniel tells us about this power in Daniel 7 is that it was a little horn. It's a little kingdom. And the question is, does the Roman church, does papal Rome fit? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's a little horn. It's a little power. It's a small power, not a big power. Vatican being one of the smallest, if not the single smallest, uh, nation on earth today. Uh, so it fits perfectly. Uh, additionally, we have this idea that uh, it would rise up among them, that is, among the nations of Western Europe. That was one of the things that Daniel said. It came up among them, and the answer, of course, is yes. It was going to be established in Europe. That's exactly where the Vatican is, right there in the country of Italy. In addition to this, it has a prominent man at the head. Daniel says that it had a man at the head, and of course, of course, we know that man uh, historically, he's known as the Bishop of Rome. Today, we call him simply the Pope, which is just Papa or Father. It says it was going to pluck up three of the tribes by the roots. When the papacy arose to power, there were three tribes in Europe that were plucked up and are now extinct. Those three tribes, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli. That this power would be different, Daniel says, that it would be somehow fundamentally different than the other powers. As, as we've already suggested, the other powers were just political entities, but this power would be a religio-political entity. 
And that is exactly what we find, that it is both a church uh, and a state. It is a church and a state combined. This power is going to rise after 476. Does this fit the papacy? The papal power rose up after 476. That's when it gained its political and religious strength in the world. After the Roman Empire, there were Germanic tribes. And there was one Germanic tribe that occupied Rome, and it was in the year 538 that this tribe was overthrown by the Pope. And we reckon that this was the beginning of the religious political power that is depicted by the little horn in Daniel 7 and by the beast in Revelation 13. Furthermore, Daniel says that this power would be a blasphemous power. And we went to uh, Scripture to find two very uh, persuasive biblical definitions of blasphemy. The first is uh, to claim to be able to forgive sins, and the second to claim to be God. We can see this in the book Dignity and Duties of the Priest. For example, on page 34 we read, the priest holds the place of the Savior himself when, by saying ego te absolvo, he absolves from sin. Also from Dignity and Duties of the Priest we read, were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance and a priest to sit in a confessional. Jesus would say over each penitent, ego te absolvo. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, ego te absolvo. And the penitents of each would be equally absolved. So here, obviously, in the little horn and in the beast in Revelation 13, we have a power that tries to act like God. It is usurping the power of God. For example, if I made that claim, or you made that claim, or any man made that claim, except for the man Christ Jesus, uh, that is a blasphemous claim. From the Catechism of the Council of Trent we read, Bishops and priests, being as they are, God's interpreters and ambassadors, empowered in His name to teach mankind the divine law and the rules of conduct, and holding, as they do, His place on earth, it is evident that no nobler function than theirs can be imagined. Justly, therefore, they are called not only angels, but even gods, because of the fact that they exercise in our midst the power and prerogatives of the immortal God. In addition to this, in the very opening portion of John Paul's book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, uh, published in 2003, we read these words. Confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the vicar of Jesus Christ and is accepted as such by believers. The Pope is considered the man on earth who represents the Son of God, who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. And here we see a very uh, unmistakable, a very unambiguous claim to taking the place, being the vicar of Christ. Well, uh, scripturally speaking, Jesus does have a vicar. He does have a representative on earth, but that representative is not the Pope. It's the Holy Spirit. And so this notion that one man is somehow in a special sense the vicar of God or the representative of God, taking the place of Jesus uh, is uh, biblically called blasphemy. What about that characteristic of making war with the saints, persecution? Well, we look at this in the context of history and we find that indeed the papal church did persecute God's people down through the Dark Ages. For hundreds of years, millions of Christians faithful to the Word of God were persecuted by the papal church. Uh, in fact, even the skeptic W.E.H. Lecky uh, in his history of the rise and influence of rationalism in Europe uh, said these words, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. And Leckie is exactly right here. He has hit the nail right on the head. And that is that this power uh, in a peerless way, in an unparalleled way, has been a persecuting power. 
particularly of Christian people, uh, but one of the greatest persecuting powers of all time. I mean, some secular historians put the number at, at upwards of a hundred million people uh, killed over the tenure of, of the Roman Church. Now let's look at the characteristic found in verse 25, the changing or thinking to change times and laws. Does the church claim to have the prerogative to change even the laws of God? Remember, that was one of the things that Daniel said. He would think to change the very times and laws of God. And the answer to that, again, is unambiguously yes, that claim is made. Now, of course, that claim is not true. Daniel didn't say they actually changed the law of God, but that they would think to change or intend to change the law of God. Uh, for example, we read in Lucius Ferrari's Prompta Bibliotheca, an article titled Papa, the Pope is of so great authority that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man, but of God, and he acts as vicegerent of God upon earth. It would think to change times and laws because when you read the Catechism, the second commandment, idol worship, it has been taken out and the tenth commandment split in two, thou shalt not covet, has been split into two commands. So you have God's law being tampered with. In the minds and the thoughts of people, God's law is different than what is taught in the Word of God. According to both Daniel and John in Revelation, one of the identifying characteristics of this power is that it would reign for three and a half years or 42 months. That is 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. It started in 538 when the Pope was able to throw out the Ostrogoths, this one Germanic tribe from Rome, and was then able to rule not only religiously but also politically, because the Little Horn power is a political and religious power. When we look at history, it is interesting that during this 1260 year period, Europe was in what many people used to call the Dark Ages. Well, you see, during that time, the scriptures became lost to the people. There was a time, especially during those 1260 years, when the Bible was not freely available to the people, to the common man in the street. As we say sometimes, the Bible was chained to the monasteries. But with the Reformation, it was high time, like Martin Luther or John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli in Switzerland and France said that the Bible has to be freed from this imprisonment. It has to be in the hands of the people. It says that the little horn will persecute the saints of the Most High. Why would it do this? Because the scriptures were a threat to the traditions of the church at Rome that was in power at the time. So in Daniel's perspective, as he's thinking about the duration or the tenure of this beast, uh, this beast does not reign for a literal three and a half years, which would be bad enough. I mean, to persecute the people of God, to wear out the saints of God, to, to speak blasphemous words against God, three and a half years would be bad enough. But in Daniel's perspective, this power reigns for more than a millennium. But this rule ended when Napoleon sent his general to take the Pope captive, and he took him captive, and he eventually died in exile, and his heart actually is buried in Valence in France while his body was taken to the Vatican. This was the mortal wound. We find two very significant dates that sort of bookend this period, 538 on the front side and 1798 on the back side. For example, in the book the Modern Papacy, page one, we read these words. Berthier, one of the generals of Napoleon, entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. The Pope and the papacy was dead, or so they thought. They were given into his hands for this amount of time. Historically, it checks out. Here we have another characteristic fulfilled by the papal church. We learn that this power is now global in its influence. For example, in verse 3 of Revelation 13, it says, all the world wanders after this beast. This is a worldwide power. So it's, it's small in its kingdom, but it's huge worldwide in its influence.
all the world is following after this power and its head. All the world looks to this power with respect and honor. According to Revelation, the Antichrist is not a secular power. It is a religious power. In fact, in 2 Thessalonians, it says that this power will take its seat in the temple of God. Paul is very clear that the temple of God is the church of God. It takes its seat in the temple of God and proclaims itself to be God and exalts itself over any so-called God or object of worship. You see in Revelation 13, a deadly wound being inflicted and the wound being healed. So you have this persecuting power coming to an end with this deadly wound being inflicted. In 1798, a deadly wound was inflicted. Berthier, under the direction of Napoleon, has effectively dismantled the papacy and exiled the uh, Pope to France. And so in the eyes of uh, observers at the time, in fact, in the eyes of many observers even following that, the papacy was done. It was over. It had been killed. This was the mortal wound. The Pope was taken captive, and everyone said, where's the papacy? Napoleon, he ridiculed it, in effect. But Scripture says, that it would receive a deadly wound, but that it would be healed and come back, apparently, even stronger than it had ever been. When you think about the power and the sway and the prominence that Rome exercised, the Church of Rome exercised uh, over a period of more than a millennium, to suggest, as the Bible does, that it would come back even stronger uh, is staggering and, frankly, frightening. This is an, a message for the end time, obviously because later on comes a vision of the second coming of Christ. So this is before Christ comes again to take us home. Now some might think that uh, this is just some fanciful, new, novel teaching. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, this teaching is something that has been held very near and very dear uh, to Protestants of all stripes. Uh, going back to the Waldensians and the Hussites, you have Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, uh, uh, Zwingli. Or Isaac Newton, another man very interested in science but also in history and in biblical interpretation, saw these things very clearly. Uh, Melanchthon, Tyndale, Ridley, Latimer, I mean the list literally is, is probably hundreds long of people, prominent people who came out of the Roman Church, because remember the Roman Church was the only show in town, the only gig in town at the time, but as you see the fall and the Protestant Reformation and the Roman Church begin to go out, uh, most Protestant reformers, in fact, with almost uh, absolute unanimity, um, you find the identification of the Roman Church as none other than the Antichrist of Revelation 13 and of 2 Thessalonians 2 and the little horn of Daniel 7. Don't misunderstand the point of this prophecy. This is not about individuals. We're not here to talk about the Pope. We're not here to talk about whether he's a good man or a bad man. This is talking about institutions, not individuals. God is not trying to pick on anyone, but he's simply telling us that there is a religion that multitudes are following that is not adequately reflecting who God is. What we're talking about here is a system. And the reason why it's so significant is because God is showing us ahead of time how history is going to play out. Good people, lots of them, are a part of the Roman Church. We're not talking about people. We're talking about a false system that the Bible identifies. Why does this prophecy focus so much on the errors, the mistakes that have happened down the way through history, even by people who believe in God? These are here in order to prepare us who live at the end of time to prepare us for the great judgment which is coming upon the world in order to be ready 
We need to know God's revelations. We need to know what the scriptures say. We need to be clear in our lives what the will of God is. And when you know the will of God, it provides a context to live by it. Watch out for the truth as it is revealed in scripture. Search the scriptures. Look at the prophetic texts of Daniel Revelation and see how it has been fulfilled in history. And you may rest assured that this is being given so that you may be warned and at the same time that you may be encouraged because you may know that God is absolutely in control. A few years ago I was on a fishing trip with a friend of mine and his son jumped into the middle of the road. Well, what he didn't see was what we did see, and that was that there was a car coming right down this highway, back country highway, going 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour, and I just let out the most blood-curdling scream, and uh, I suppose someone looking on might have thought, um, wow, why is he so angry? Why so urgent? Why so upset? But the reality is, is that that yell that might have been perceived even by the child himself, and, and perhaps by onlookers, as a yell of anger or a yell of punishment uh, was actually a yell of love, wasn't it? Some might be tempted to hear the message, the scriptural message of the Antichrist as a yell, as a yell of anger, as a yell of punishment, uh, but what is it? It's a yell of love. Even now, even today, everyone has to make a decision. Do I want to follow the Word of God? Do I want to follow the simple interpretation of Scripture, which clearly states that those will make it in the end who are faithful to the commandments of God, to all of them? Now, this is a message that applies to all of us. This is a Scripture that was for us all. God is trying to arrest our attention, to, to get our attention and say, there's danger here. There's real danger here. Something is going to interpose itself, try and interpose itself between the sinner and the Christ. And, and God yells, he said, danger, there's danger. What this text tells us is that the kinds of things that happened in the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages will happen again at the end of time. And that we who live in the end of time need to be prepared to set our lives aright in the light of what the scriptures teach. So what we have to do now is look around and see what is the little horn power, this beastly power, doing now. This is not just uh, something out of history. This is not just the dust of the past. This is what is even happening now. Some people think we're in modern times, everything has changed. Well, has it really? 